I've got a lot to talk with you about, but before we do anything, we need to talk about safety protocols. So that's Steve's department. We want to make sure during this whole process, we stay as safe as possible. It's very important that you take what he says very seriously. We understand it's going to be weird for a few days, but this thing's like a house of cards. If any one of us during this process tests positive, basically everything's over because we would lose so much time for quarantine. Jim told me last week I was the safety officer. And I got up this morning and I started putting this together and I realized I'm not the safety officer. You know who the safety officer is? It's everybody in this room and you guys have to do it. I know I'm gonna go home after this and I'm gonna do smart things and I'm gonna keep my circle small. So that's what I'm expecting all of you to do until this process is over. And the problem is with this whole thing is, this depends on what you did July 7th. What did you do July 7th? That's 14 days ago. Something to think about. Anybody know the seven day rolling average of coronavirus cases in Tangipahoa Parish? The average is 76. That's probably that many seats. That's like 76 seats. That's a day. So, there's a lot of coronavirus out there. If you don't have to go somewhere, don't go somewhere. I'm really excited to be at rehearsal. We're doing a show. Not many, not many people are doing shows. We're gonna be special. <laughs> this play, The Tooth of Crime, is a bucket list play for me. I think every director has a certain number of plays that they really want to direct before their time is done. And since I was in graduate school, really even before that, I've been a huge fan of Sam Shepard's work. And this of all of his plays is the most intriguing to me. I've never worked on a production of it. I've only read it. I've been in several Sam Shepard plays. I've directed some, acted in many, but never this one. And I've always wanted to do it. It's my favorite of his, to be honest with you. It's kind of obscure, it's not his best known piece, but I think it's his best piece. The first time Jim brought it up to me was after initiation for APO. Then he said, hey, are you gonna be around in spring of 2020? And I said, yeah, I'll still be around. And he goes, well, I've got this play I need you to write music for. And he didn't give me the script until the next fall. And uh, he gave it to me around October and I started reading the script and I was like, this is absolutely insane. The script is nuts, but the more I read it, the more I fell in love with it. The more I kind of started to laugh with it and kind of identify with it. And so over the Christmas break, I wrote all this music for it. I just wanted to be in it for contributing to the ideas. I didn't even think I was gonna get cast, to be honest. It's really up my alley. It's exactly my taste and my interest. I love rock music and I love like alternative culture and that's exactly what this show is representing especially the direction that Jim was taking in it it's talking about the culture of music and how it's changed over time and I thought that was really interesting I really love the concept of the worlds combining and then worlds colliding and then seeing one world fall apart while one rises because that's what happens every day in our world and I think it's a really awesome way to tell that story through the lenses of musicians in a dystopian Hunger Games type world where it's either kill or be killed, but in their world it's make the best music or fall off the face of the planet. Wanna be a rocker and study the moves. Jerry Lee Lewis Bly, use some blue suede shoes. Move your head like Rob Stewart, put your ass in the grind. Talking to a sock to it, get your in When I got the call from Jim that said, hey, I want you as Crow, I immediately started looking at the script. That was probably like months ago, back in March, February. I've been working on this and trying to get off book, trying to create these songs. And it, it was difficult, like creating these songs and being having to step up because Jim giving me a lot of creative freedom to add in words to make these raps work. Creating something from virtually nothing was, was something that I never thought that I'd ever get to do from finding the beats to finding the way these lyrics flowed with one another. It was just, it was so fun that I, 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 I thought I would never get this opportunity and to have it, I'm, I'm just so grateful. 
hardest part was what was still to come. And as to put them in a room together and see if they could create music. That's a crazy thing to do. And there's like one professional musician among the people I cast. Most aren't even music majors. And so asking them, you know, taking nine or 10 people and putting them into a room and being like, okay, I need you to make 10 songs. And I don't want them all to be heavy metal or rock. I want some rap in there. I want some folk. I want some ballads. Like, and here's the words, but that's all I'm giving you. And I'm not a musician or a composer, so good luck. So it started out researching the varying periods of history that uh, Jim, the director, mentioned that he wanted each of the characters to kind of represent. He mentioned a couple artists for each of them. So like, for example, he wanted a non-white female for Crow, who was based on anything from like Missy Elliott rap to more modern things to show that, that progression into more modern music compared to Haas's anywhere from like 50s to 80s rock and roll vibes for Haas, punk vibes for Cheyenne, stuff like that. And I worked from there and breaking down, taking each of those characters and the list of artists that he chose for them, finding things that kind of tied them all together in ways that I thought fit the character. The set only has a throne. That's the only set piece, like and in the whole thing. So I was given extreme amounts of creative liberty to make it whatever I wanted it to be. I started out by looking at classic rock shows. That was the first thing. I'm actually, I don't listen to much rock, but my dad, my dad did, so he helped me a lot too. Uh, Jim and Steve, they gave me specific bands and concerts and I just like went on Pinterest and looked up and saved a couple that I liked. So eventually we came upon this rock temple theme. I think just by chance, I was playing with the shape of a triangle, and I, want, I knew I wanted triangles. Because we, I knew I wanted the DJ on top, because he's, he's God, he's not a part of this world. So I wanted a distinct separation between Haas, his house, his throne, and the DJ. So I created levels so they could have places to run around and stuff, and then the DJ just isolated at the top. Sort of tracing COVID's impact on this show is kind of a winding road. We had a month of rehearsal under our belt. Mostly music, some acting, actually a lot of script analysis because we had to create what this world was gonna be, but also a lot of music rehearsals and creation. And man, they had beyond risen to the challenge. So I was in class on the Thursday that class got canceled, that school got transferred to online, and we all got the email at the same time. And our teacher was like, we should probably pause class and read this. So we all started reading, realized, wow, this is a little more serious than we all thought, obviously. And then it was like in like the span of like four days, it went from completely normal to we were all going home. The university's closed. These shows are closed. Wherever they're at in their runs, they're done. And everybody's going home. Our country is in the midst of a great national trial unlike any we have ever faced before. You all see it. You see it probably better than most. We're at war with a deadly virus. Success in this fight will require the full, absolute measure of our collective strength, love, and devotion. Very important. The emergency is going to get worse before it gets better. How much worse, we don't know. But what we do know is we can influence how much worse it gets. And that's what this press conference is about because the bottom line is we're in a race against time when it comes to this coronavirus and its rapid spread in Louisiana. The mitigation measures that we have in place and that we will continue to uh, put in place will not be effective if our people and our businesses don't actively participate, if they don't comply, if they're don't stay at home unless it's absolutely necessary to move out. Obviously, clearly after our safety discussion, you are brave to be here. You didn't have to be here. I'm grateful and I, I'm also kind of a little proud. It means you, you must love what we're doing. So I gotta tell you something and then you just gotta hang in there and let me talk a little more because I know you're gonna have questions. We're not doing this play. We're not doing it as a live play for a live audience. It cannot be done right now. To be honest, I started to cry when Jim told us we wasn't gonna perform this show like as a full production anymore. It was one of the most devastating news that I've gotten in, in this pandemic.
coming to realize who Crow was as a person it was a creative outlet for me, getting to live out how I'm feeling through Crow, but also coming out victorious in the end. It was like something uplifting that just helped me through this. All that work, and I, and I will admit, when I got home from rehearsal that night, I, you know, I was still very frustrated. I was still very angry. For me, there is that fear in the back of my mind that I'm never gonna get a chance like this again, that I'm not gonna get casted again, that this might have been my only chance to show what I can do. So there's that fear in the back of my mind, and it's just, I've spent a lot of time thinking about who Starman is and who this character is and how they fit into this world. And more people in this room than you realize have been working on this show for over a year now. So I said, we have to do something, okay? The best plan that we could come up with is to take the stuff we've worked the hardest on, which by and large is the music, get you in full costume, get you in full makeup. And the dream goal is to shoot as much music as we can. If I had my way, if time would permit, if we could do it, I want to film every song in this play with you in your full costumes and makeup as your characters under the lights doing that, like a music video. That's the ultimate goal. I'm not sure we can achieve it in such a short time. Because originally it was supposed to be really big and then when I had to redesign the whole thing, I like took it from this massive, like huge temple to just like a couple of well-placed platforms. and. Oddly enough, I, I kind of like this just as much. It didn't like, I don't think it ruined it. It's just a, a different take. Any form of performing arts, it's like a way of expressing yourself. So for me personally, being in this play, it's how I express myself. And I've actually gotten into arguments with my parents about still being involved in these plays because this, I feel like this is one of the only ways I can express myself. So some people just, want to have to understand that. Being clumped up in the house during this whole pandemic is really hard. And then some people had to move home. I had to move back home and I'm just at home with my parents judging me. Like, I need this. I need to be able to express myself. There's definitely a risk that's happening with this. Go without a doubt. Right now, I'm so glad you're wearing an N95 mask. I don't have a mask on right now as I'm talking. There's inherent risks just right here. I might not be showing systems, I could carry this. Super excited at the possibility of doing something so different. I've never done anything like this before. And I think it's a great opportunity to really push our creativity to a different level. I had a, a theater teacher in high school who said, creativity comes whenever you put restrictions on yourself. This is truly showing how far we can go with this material. I think this needs to be shared, this vision that we have. and. The entire point of this play needs to be shared more often. It's a hard show to put on. So obviously the show is not going to be just put on willy-nilly by any theater. But the ideas behind like this like toxic culture behind producing art in general needs to be like put on the forefront. But for us as like a whole company, we have already we put so much work into it. We were already so far ahead in rehearsals and you know, people had their lines memorized and we were all looking forward to it, and this is one of my biggest roles that I've had here at Southeastern. It's just, I don't want to give that up. You know, we're not doing the full show, and we're not doing everything. We're just doing what we need to do, and I feel like that's enough. Like, I feel like that is, that's something that we can all look at and be like, wow, we actually did that during COVID, and we were safe with it, and we got to do what we love. I still get to put the work that I put into it into these music videos and into the songs, get to create them more because it still gets to show our characters and who we are and how we develop these characters as people. We are taking as many precautions as we can. We're not allowing anybody else in this process. So I think that under the circumstances, we are being safe. We've been told to socially distance outside of rehearsal as well, keeping our circle small, not just for the sake of our families, but for the sake of other peoples that we have here. And I think that it is meant to happen how it is happening. This is what we do. This is how theater works. We adapt and overcome to the conditions that happen. I mean, the safest thing to do would be for everybody to just stay home, wear a mask and all that, but that's, I mean, that's obviously not gonna happen anytime soon. I mean, you can't be scared of everything. You gotta 
get out and live your life no matter what. So I definitely think this show must go on at this point. To grind and rap. like two and a half months of my life have just been like dog shit. My grandma fell and had a brain bleed and had a craniotomy and was put into the ICU. And then like two weeks later, my girlfriend texted me and went, hey Grant, um, I don't love you anymore, so I'm leaving you over Snapchat messages. <laughs> so that's a double whammy right there. So I just wanna say thank you to all of y'all for being my distraction from the real world so that I can have peace in life. I wanna thank everyone from the bottom of my heart and just say how grateful I am to have been a part of this experience and how honored and blessed I feel. So we just wrapped and I had a great time. So we just wrapped on Tooth for Crime and I honestly am so, so thankful for this experience. Everything about this was incredible. The cast and the crew are so amazingly talented. This whole experience has been amazing. I am just so glad I got to be a part of it. I'm really sad it's over, but I'm just really thankful for everyone in the cast and crew and just like that we got to do this, honestly. So we just wrapped on filming for Tooth of Crime. Uh, I've been working on this show, or been a part of this show, since October of last year, and now it's uh, August, and we're about to start a whole new school year. We just now finished with the show, and we made something very special. How'd it go, Jim? Wow, we're wrapped. <laughs> Finally. We made a movie. <laughs> this didn't start out as a movie. No. <laughs> but, uh... I hope it was rewarding for everyone. Yeah. It sure was for me. I'm so glad we did this. Definitely for me too. We just wrapped and I am exhausted. <laughs> um, I'm tired, but I'm also relieved um, that we finally got to do this. And I feel like this is a victory. We, we won. We... We beat COVID.